Good morning, traders, and welcome to the number one morning show to get all you need right here on pre-market prep. Let's go ahead and dive on in. Today, we got overnight action. What is the Russell rebalance? We'll talk all about it. Value trade out of favor. It's growth back, baby. We'll talk a little bit about Zendesk getting a little bit of those shares rising on up. Did you guys catch that? We'll take a look at the bank stress did they pass the test? We'll talk about it. Buybacks and divs may be increasing. We'll talk a little bit about why we think that could possibly be happening going into Monday. And of course, some earnings on out there. FedEx, we might even touch CarMax. And stay tuned, guys, because we got a great show for you guys like always. But do us the favor. Let us know if there's any stock that's on your radar. Throw it up in the chat to the left. And of course, do me the favor. Hit that thumbs on up and let's get it started. Pre-market prep. Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders. Let's go ahead. Let's get it started. Let's bring on my man, Joel Conan. What's going on? And of course, none other than the man, Triple D. What's going on? Sop, sop, sop. All right. Let's uh, let's run down the futures real quick. Uh, We're firmly in the green here on this Friday. Up 27 and quarter handles 38.27. We'll see how good everyone's memory is because uh, we're getting back up to uh, an important level from last week. Uh, Crude, that's in the green by $2.03 at 106.29. Gold down 250, 1827.30. Silver in the red by 18 cents at 2086. Bitcoin just hanging out here, just hanging out at 20K. Will it hold? Up $215 at $21,115. And Ethereum futures, they're up $72 at $1194.50. Uh, so we're going to bring Triple D on. Before we get to the markets, Triple D, I got to start wow. out with a two point trivia, uh, two part trivia question oh, that young bitch probably will not have a shot at getting. I mm. suck at trivia, though. And, and you will probably only get. One one part of it. All right, all right, all right. Let's go, let's go. go. Are you guys ready? I'm itching. I'm itching. I'm itching. We're ready. Let's go. Not today, but tomorrow is a very, very important day for two reasons. Very important day for two reasons. Give me both of those reasons. Both those reasons. Uh One, it's Saturday, the weekend. I need a weekend because I got this cold. I need the two (laughs) days to recover. That's one reason. The second reason, I have no idea. Okay. I'll give you a a, a year milestone mark. 30 years. Are you, do you have an anniversary, 30-year anniversary? I'm, I've been married longer than that. You've been married longer than 30 years? Yeah. Holy. Joel, when did you get so old? <laughs> uh, starting in 1963. 30 uh, years. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one. I don't actually have no any idea. Thirty years then. You you were kind of warm. You were kind of doing okay there with the, with like the marriage thing. Emily's birthday. Close. Dun, it's Dana's. Dun, dun. Yep. Dana's birthday. There yes. you go. I was all over it. I was all around it. Happy, Is happy Dana thirty birthday. years old now? Yes. How? When did that happen? <laughs> and yeah, and I don't. It. And no, Locked I didn't have chicken. her when I was fifteen. <laughs> I mean, that's what people think. They think. I, I started the Bright Office in 99, and there was two little girls running around. And you're telling me the one's 30 years old now. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's how crazy. quickly it goes, Dennis. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I did and not then, think your daughters would be 30 years old now. Uh, the years are flying by. I don't even know what's I going know, on anymore. I know. I know. Oh, wow. And, and then the other one is Happy correlated. birthday, Dana. Yeah. Well, this is why. Well, for, for, so let me tell you the second one, and then I'm going to ask the chat a favor. Uh, the second one was that was the same day that they started Globex trading at the Mercantile Exchange. 
Still trying to figure it out 30 years later. One. But uh, so can Big every- Saturday for you, Joel. Yeah, Happy yeah, birthday, can, Dana. Can everyone in the chat, and it's D A Y N A, there's a, we can we're a little we'll bit different. Shout out. Can we'll we get a few chat. in the chat? D A Y N A. We'll have Mitch print them out. She'd like Happy that. birthday. Happy yeah, birthday. We'll Dana. do it. Happy birthday, Dana. Okay. <laughs> let's Sound get- that birthday alarm. Let's go. All let's right. go. All right. Good let's stuff. go. Russell Rebalance today at the close it's gonna be crazy folks it's always crazy so get your crazy hats out and uh get ready for some volatility because this uh russell rebalance is always uh crazy on the close mitch is gonna bring up so if you go if you want mitch will give you the link the link yes, is, if you just I simply just google russell Boom. reconstitution i got you guys you'll quickly find it i've got it here i can post it in the chat you Here's post it additions chat? i got you already getting in there additions oh, I was already now in there. we got so many happy birthdays here, for dana. they love dana <laughs> i you guys the have link it. as well so you get the russell 3000 and you're looking at that right now the ads and deletes Mm-hmm. So naturally thinking, you know, this is the trade. You think that the ads go up and the deletes go down. That's the way the trade used to be played 20 years ago. Pretty textbook. Ads will show strength as the indexers got to buy them on the close. Deletes show weakness as obviously they get sold on the close. That is not the case anymore. The trades get crowded. The trades get gained. So there is very little predictive value in the saying that the ads are going to go up and the deletes are going to go down. So how do you make money from it? The way, or the safe way that I have played it, because I don't play it, you know, the old way anymore because it doesn't work anymore. The new way that I've played it is simply to fade the closing moves. You get a stock gapping up on the close. You get a stock gapping down on the close. I'm usually fading those moves, meaning I'm buying stocks that are gapping down. I'm selling short stocks that are gapping up on the close. That has worked pretty well. Nothing works 100% of the time, but that has worked pretty well. So I'm giving you strategies on how we approach this. It used to be build the portfolio, watch your ad portfolio go up, watch your delete portfolio go down for weeks before and collect money. It's just not that simple anymore. And this year, I think more of the same. Obviously, increased volatility in the markets have um, you know thrown some of that out as well. But it's just not so simple to buy all the ads, sell all, short all the deletes, and make money. So just be careful because, again, anything that is predictive like that, that everybody knows, is often crowded. So you got to be careful with those crowded trades. Mitch is just scrolling through. If you want some of the big names that are going on in the Russell 3000, it's a lot of the newer companies here. Mm-hmm. Affirm, Airbnb, Coinbase, Lucid, um, Robinhood, Roblox, Ask Sentinel, mm-hmm. SoFi path a lot of the kathy names actually coming out there's a few there too I, again on the deletes you know a lot of times they're getting deleted because it's market caps yeah. they've prices have fallen so much that they've just fallen out of favor uh but there's you know some like you know gan for instance is a delete because the stocks went down so much clovis oncology which was a retail darling a while ago that's a delete um nls which is obviously um you know the uh, equipment maker, Pel- not Peloton, but you could say competitor, the real equipment maker, NLS, it's on the delete list. But just go through. So you can go through. You can see all the stocks that are on there. Just be aware that if your stock is on one of these lists, it can have some increased volatility on the close and it can have some wild moves. Sometimes that'll get you out of a trade. Maybe it'll get you into a trade. Maybe it'll get you into a price that you wanted to buy your stock. But it's very important to be aware if your stocks are on these lists. So you got the Russell Reconstitution 3000 list that Mitch is showing there right now. Then you have the micro cap list, which is also on the link that I gave into the mm-hmm. chat there, yeah, um, which you can look as too. well. Yeah, so, just, and the micro I'll give you guys list. This, this site right here that will give you all of them in one page here, and then you guys can just click on over. There you to go. It. There you go. So you can Couple see right here there at the Russell. Dennis, is this, yes? this, is, this is quarter. Is quarterly, right? No, yearly. Yearly. These okay. are, the Russell is yearly. Second thing, in, and you always, and I don't know if you mentioned it or not, you got, if they're coming out of an index, you got to be aware, you know, the percentage of that index too, because that can have a factor. And then, Great the, point. The, and then, and then the third thing, uh, that, because Dennis is the expert in this, this is not something that he's like, th- this is like in and out. Like you, like you get, you know, the big sell off. 
you look for the in, you know, the sometimes it's just like when what sometimes about when Tesla went in? You want instant gratification on you this. do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You do. Uh, a lot like the like the thought process behind the fade on the close. So there's multiple ways. There are people who literally build the portfolios ahead of time. They buy all the ads, short all the deletes, and they're trying to extract the alpha from the indexers, the anticipation that the index is going to buy the ads and sell the deletes. That sometimes works, but for the most part, I've noticed the last few years it hasn't been working. So like I said, I've traded it that way years ago. And in some days, you'll actually see on the last day that it reverses. The trades are so crowded that everybody's long the ads that they just collapses. So you've seen that happen too. So, But just be aware, like a stock like Airbnb, that is obviously an ad. You know, it's almost making a new 52-week low yesterday. Now, again, market effects here, you know, are a big part of that. But definitely not showing relative strength here whatsoever yet. I mean, a firm, you know, and you did see some of these stocks starting to show some life yesterday um, with the growth versus value, which we can get into in a second. But, you know, we're just talking index effects here. The, sh- the thought with the fade on the close is that mm-hmm. if a stock is gapping up for index reasons, it's not fundamental, it's nothing to the company, um, it, usually those moves tend to go back they tend to you know go back revert to the mean they yeah they tend to either you know revert to the mean or they tend to just give it back so they Mm -hmm. don't always nothing works 100 percent of the time maybe it's going to be crowded the other way so you've got to be aware but that's the thought process behind the 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 closing fade if you're putting it on ahead of time you're gambling a bit you're gambling if the trade one isn't crowded and two that it's going to go textbook and we know in this market nothing has to go textbook it might Maybe the ads are all going to gap up, the deletes are all going to gap down, but I've seen it go the exact opposite way on these Russell rebounds days too. And that's why I'm very cautious with the way I approach it. And I'm more of a fader of moves on the close as opposed to trying to anticipate the direction of the move. Okay. Well, oh, no. Now, <clears throat> go ahead. Joel, Joe, before, before you come in there, just as a tip that Dennis said there, right? And so one of the things that you want to do, especially if you're a day trader out there and you kind of react to scanners and things like that, is maybe check this list before you get into, you know, down and dirty here. So another tip, of course, you know, just use your control F, type in the ticker, and it should show up there for you. Um, so if, if that's a just a tip that I'll give out there, maybe you want to keep this open and you're checking through it as you're going through your trading day. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, I was just going to say, and Dennis did mention this, but I want to I want to reiterate it. If you have a particular entry point or exit point in one of these stocks, you know, a stock that maybe is coming out that you want to buy, so you know, just put like some wayward order out there, you may get it. So that's another way to use it to your advantage. And then the third thing, yeah. I don't know about the option values in the you know in these stocks, how heavily the traded the options are, but you know. Be careful because, you know, the closing price, you could be in the money on a call or something and it just gets crushed. So I I don't know if these are that heavily traded in the option market, but just I'm not necessarily telling you how to how to like make money and take advantage of it. What I'm trying to do is like, uh oh, I just got assigned, you know, a position on something or I got taken out of something. So there's another another couple of ways to do it should could be a pretty good volume on it. There's going to be action. There's usually action. Very seldom do you see a Russell rebalance. And I was like, ooh, that was quiet. Now, remember, there's not only a Russell rebalance. There's also movement around within the indices itself, like certain stocks going into the value index, coming out of the growth index. I know CNBC has been talking about it for a while, where you've got Meta and PayPal and Netflix moving from the growth index into the value index. Because they are. They've all of a sudden turned into value stocks, which is crazy and mind-boggling to think, you know, like PayPal, which was one time trading 45 times earnings, has come down so far that it's actually a value stock now. So you have jockeying going that way too. So, you know, in, when you're even doing sideways action, going from one index to another, there's ads and sales happening there too. So you can see movement in those stocks as well. So it won't just be the stocks on this list. It'll be a pile of other stocks too that are moving. So again... That's uh, the best way that I've approached it, like at least, you know, that seems like the most consistent way is to fade those closing moves where you're not trying to predict the direction, just saying, you know, and the way you do that is I put LOC or limit on close stocks here, sell short LOC here, buy LOC here, limit on close. I don't do market on close because a market on close could execute anywhere. So, I mean, if all of a sudden it gaps down, your market on close sell uh, sell short LOC and you're getting filled way down there. You don't want that price. 
I only want stocks that have gone gapping up. I want to be short them. If they're gapping down, I want to be buying them. Now, again, nothing works 100% of the time. So maybe some of these, you know, some of these deletes could gap down and then continue to go lower. I've seen that happen too. You kind of do want the immediate gratification. You want to start seeing them, you know, come back in the after hour session. You hope for a little mean reversion if you got to hold it into Monday. Uh, but, you know, that's the overall way that I approach Russell Rebalance now. All right, definitely. Uh, what do you guys want to get into now? You going to talk a little bit about the growth and value? You guys want to you want to cover? You, you more got of the Zen, Zen up desk? there. Yeah, got, Joel, let's do Joel's Zen. Zen. Joel's Zenning out. He he's he's feeling some Zen bullish. Uh, <laughs> just shout out to the chat there, Zen bullish out there. Zen shares trading up. Oh, one of the things is Joel. I'll, I'll let you know, man. You're muted. I I love you, but. <laughs> We love you, I can man, see the energy, crazy. but you're, you're muted, my friend. Zen shares trade Yo, up 50% check. after hours following Wall Street Journal's report that the company is close to a takeover deal with the group uh, Hellman and Friedman uh, and Permita. Um, so just keep your eyes on what's going on here because I, I didn't see a specific price. I know that uh, Dennis has a little bit more background here, um, but Zena had urged Zendesk to incorporate significant board changes or a sale following a failed bid by SurveyMonkey parent uh, Moment, uh, Momentive Global. So uh, here coming in, Zendesk up big on the rumor. They, and Wall Street Journal said they did not have a price for yeah, this, that's... but they did say um, in that article, um, and you know, I, when you see read these, you got to read the articles because it's worth the time to try to go find the price or any color they have behind it. They did say at one time that they, and I don't know, you don't know how correct everything, accurate everything is, but mm -hmm. you know, the rumor was that they rejected a seventeen billion dollar <laughs> buyout offer for this now again market has completely collapsed since then so don't start thinking about 17 billion dollar buyout but to give you perspective zen at 57.95 closed with a seven billion dollar market cap so they're saying basically you know no, they're not saying anything but if you're reading between the lines you think okay well they rejected a 17 billion dollar one a while ago now markets have collapsed they're not going to get 17 billion again which would put the stock up at like 140 dollars um, I think it's more that if they do a deal, it's going to be at a lower price. But because it was so high before, could they do it at 110? Could they do it at 120? I mean, it's all speculation, but it's possible. And I don't think, I think the risk arbs that are trading this right now in this rumor are speculating that, you know, this deal, if it does get done, is probably going to be north of $100. So, and that's why they're giving it so much premium, up 50%. Now, again, when you're buying stocks, up 50% on rumors. It's right in the Wall Street Journal article. There, you know, there's no guarantee that they're going to reach a deal. There's no guarantee that this thing's going to get bought out. So, I mean, if the deal falls apart, then you give it right back, and you lose, you know, a good chunk of money here trading on this. So, I don't like buying stocks up 50% on rumors, but I'm not shorting it either because when I'm reading the tea leaves here, I tend to think if there's going to be a deal, it's going to be north of 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. I just, That's I just, just me with, I, reading between the lines yeah, in the Wall Street yeah. Journal article. Just mm -hmm. my opinion. Well, first thing is, I, I first thing I asked you guys was, you know, is it a specific company? You said no, it's private equity. So, same private know. equity though that they were citing before, like some similar firms that were trying to buy. But we still don't before. know who it is. We yeah, still don't. yeah, it's in the Wall Street Journal article. There's a couple. The well, they said name? multiple, multiple. But okay. yeah, there. Well, I don't have it in front of me the article. So yeah, the okay. Um, Ninety four ten pre market high. Um, if the, if there's real juice in this, then you know if this deal's going over north of a hundred, whoever's got the memo, they're gonna jam this thing through ninety four ten. They're gonna get a bid at ninety five. They're gonna take it to a hundred. And the only the way it's going there prices. is if they get more confirmation of a price, Joel, or if they get an actual like you know that it's a done deal. And it's I mean, gonna so, they'll fade. I think it will fade. Well, then. this is the way they all trade. So you can't yep. even trade them technically. You can't even worry about technicals on any of this. It's just a now it's coin flip territory where deal or no deal. Same thing with Twitter. It's deal or no deal. Risk garbs are in here. Technicals take a back seat. Where is we we need more information on what is the potential price? Give me an actual price. Two is a deal confirmed or is the deal doesn't happen. And I mean, um, from the Wall Street Journal article, Hellman and Freeman um, and Permira, Permira, I guess it is. So our potential, you know, suitors here that would be putting the group that the group that could okay. potentially buy out Zendesk. 
So, I mean, you're looking here. That's, you know, where we're at right now. I've done risk arbitrage for 22 years, so I know a little bit about it. And I can just tell you from a risk arb perspective here, that when I'm reading it and I read that Wall Street Journal article right away, I'm thinking, oh, they cited a $17 billion potential takeout on this thing last year. Things at $7 billion now. They're not doing it for eight. They're not doing it for nine. They'll want at least 10, and 10 brings you to probably where we are right now. So, but I'm thinking, you know, they're going to do it for 12, and that'd be 110 bucks. I mean, I, I'm thinking if they, if, I'm thinking for, to get Zendesk to say yes, the price is going to have to be north of 100 bucks. So, and I think the risk arbs are saying the same thing. And Wall Street Journal, whenever you're looking at rumors, you know, WSJ, they get big scoops. They often do come to fruition. They don't always come to fruition, but they often do. So, I mean, right here, it's kind of coin flip territory. No deal. Give it all back. Deal? Could be a $110 stock. Yeah, I mean, if you took some flyers on some weekly calls or something like that, and you're looking at the 60s or something, ooh, I don't know. It, 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 it's, uh, you know, you can roll them and hope for more. But, I mean, if you took lotteries on this stock, um, you know you know what I would do. But let, let's look at what else this is going to move here, right? If there's smoke, there might be fire in the sector. And we talked about some other stocks that may be trading off this news. I think the first one that came to our mind was Splunk, right? It did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. First one I thought was Splunk as well. And I think the market's thinking the same thing. If you look Splunk, it is trading up 2.5%. It was trading up last night on these rumors. Again, this is specific to Zen. There's a million cloud stocks. You know, you yep. get in these SAS companies and there's just a million of them. So you can kind of just pick. But the reason I picked on Splunk, I have no position in it, but the reason I thought maybe, you know, if you're looking for sympathy and if Zen gets bought, that some people start thinking about Splunk. Because I believe, if my memory serves me correct, and you might be able to, you know, collaborate long this time with me, ago, Dennis, that was Splunk like... was rumored to get bought a while ago. And obviously, you know, if you know, start seeing, we've had Anaplan get bought so far, similar, obviously, stock. Um, and uh, so now you're getting Zendesk that potentially might get bought. So they're thinking, who else is there? I mean, there's a million of these cloud names, but Splunk's one that jumps out to me that I'm like, okay, because I think this was rumored before. I think some people might start yes, thinking, yes. oh, it's Splunk the next one. Actually, it was back in February. Uh, Did when you find stuff. it? Cisco, yeah. In, there was in, rumors in, that, that Splunk had turned down an offer from Cisco. For worth more than 20 bill. There you go. So I think I think you'll see Splunk show a little bit of life here this morning. Obviously, if Zen starts to leak, then you know you start to see them leak out here too. Uh, but you know, if you're just looking... There's a million names, I mean, and I'm not going to speculate because there's like literally a hundred names of these, but one that did jump out to me was Splunk. I mean, you go to like a Koopa Software, you could go, there's just a pile of them. Um, and Koop's bit up here this morning too, but, and it's been really beat up as well. I mean, Koopa Software was $370, 60 bucks. So, I mean, could that be one that shows a little bit of life today off of this? I think so. I think it's possible. Also, Dennis, what you were thinking about, too, and what came to my mind was back in June of 2019, uh, Splunk was rumored. It was Salesforce was included. Yeah. SAP was included. Microsoft was included. Oracle was included. And Workday. So, uh, But that's a while ago. And <laughs> those companies are probably pretty it's glad a, they didn't do it back then. Now It's, it's a different environment now. Game. Obviously, yep. a lot of these stocks, valuations, multiple contraction has really happened happen but when you think about you know but other potential stocks in the sector that could get bought out the first one that jumps out to me is Splunk so I think I think and again I don't have a position on it I don't know if I'll take a position on it at the open we'll see where it opens uh, but I think you could have a little sympathy move here on that one all right let's go ahead let's talk a little bit about what we're really seeing now we're seeing a little bit of a battle between the value trade and oh growth gosh. And it's definitely uh, giving a little bit of a swing towards the other side. Yeah. What are you seeing out there, Dennis? I know that you're deep in the action and, and yeah. kind of following this move. Uh, is is the value trade starting to get out of favor? Well, yeah. And we've been talking about this and predicting this for a while, that eventually they would come for the value names. We've been saying this for a month. I was a month early on the oil names. Like I kept thinking, eventually they're going to sell Chevron. You know, it was what the tip off for me was Nucor. When Nucor was $187, and then they started selling oh, yeah, it, and like that, eventually yep. they're coming for all these value names, all the cyclical value names. Um, you know, and, and and obviously, you know, I thought back in May, 
I'm like, when Chevron was $170, I'm like, I think eventually they're going to start selling the stock. Dead wrong for three weeks because it went up to $182, but eventually I'm proven right here. And it's been an ugly, ugly sell-off. Look no farther than, if you want to see growth versus value, look no further than Warren Buffett. This recent sell-off has been a total value sell-off, not a gross sell-off. The Kathy names have held up very, very well because they already had their sell-off. It's been a, gro- a value sell-off. Birch.B, $300. Two and a half weeks ago, $267. So the bulk of this S&P 11% sell-off that everybody is talking about has not come from value or not come from growth. It has come out of the value names. ARKK is actually close to a two-month high. That's incredible in this market where you got Burke making new lows every day. So the crowded value trade coming off, the uncrowded growth trade going in. And we've been talking about that. And that's why I've been saying, you know, last couple of days is like, I've never been a fan of Kathy Wood, but right now I kind of like her. Well, you know what? $40 ARKK. We were saying that two days ago. It's $44 here now. It just moved up 10%. So you can see clearly, I mean, this is why, you know, I'm down here in the gutter trading stocks all the time. I'm going to notice the rotation before other people because I'm trading so much physically here. And that's what gives me an edge. It's not that, you know, I'm, I have a crystal ball. It's that I'm down here, I start seeing flows change. And we've been seeing that flow change, you know, from value to growth here for the last couple of weeks. And that trade continues. Is it going the other way and starting to get crowded? I think some of the value names are starting to get oversold. So, I mean, at a certain point in time, if you're shorting value names now, you're way late to the party. Because the XLU, which is an absolute gift up at $76, you know, sells off basically 20% in in two weeks. Incredible sell-off. In utility stocks they were crowded and in a rising interest rate environment that stuff's not that attractive so you got to think of the environment that you're in so all of this again was predictable and predicted on this show so i think you know how we approach it now and i actually had a a, a twitter a twitter follower reach out to me maj there uh, he wanted to talk slumberger and oil and gas i mean i think we should talk it's been a pretty significant sell-off in the oil and gas names which we predicted now, at a point, that's at a certain point in time, you come in. Have they sold off enough? I mean, Slumberger has basically given back its last, like SLB. We're talking has given back. Man, it's given back almost its all 2022 gains in a couple of weeks, from 49 to 34. I think SLB, if it got down to 30, I think it's a logical bounce point. I think I would be a buyer of SLB at 30. I'm not sure it's come down quite far enough yet. Could just start nibbling here. You could, but you're trying to catch a falling knife, which is always scary. Yeah, I mean, because this is hard because, you know, the person who reached out to you, you know, are, you know, did they miss an exit on the long, you know, that, that like that's one perspective or are they looking to buy the dip in the, you know, from the other perspective, um, just looking at the monthly here and the way that, you know, just looking at the past history, once it's had a big red month, it really hasn't stopped. Now, of course, this was COVID. Right. So, you know, that's an extraordinary circumstance. Uh, This was back in uh, July, right, of uh, 2018. Had a a nice string of red months here. Same thing going back to 17. So, of course, always different circumstances. So if you're looking for an exit, I mean, and you don't want to sell it at whatever, 35 and a half, 36 bucks. The best thing you can hope for is, you know, a couple lows in the same area and then gauge the bounce. Uh, it's just going to be a whole different route this time, right? Because everyone was winners here. No one wanted to sell. Now they're, now they're seller's remorse for yeah. all these people that didn't sell up here. Yeah. There's people that like, hey, I'm going to catch this at 42. Oh, wait, it gapped down. It's at 40. I'm going to wait till it gets back at 42. So I just hope for some consolidation. You know, maybe you put your low in there, a couple days of consolidation, a couple lows in the same area, and then a little bit of strength on the way up. But from a lot, like to trying to buy the dip in this one, I, I 30 bucks. That's as good a number to me. And I, I like far, the 32. Yep. Uh, yep. One thing to think about, and this is what we were saying on the show a month ago, and again, we were three weeks early on this trade, but it eventually happened. It's absurd to think that if we're going to a recession, it's not going to hit the commodities. It's going to hammer the commodities too. It's absurd to think that when you have 
pain at the pumps like we're seeing that people you know aren't going to be a little more conservative you know and maybe what they're doing i can see it up here i'm in the the biggest boating area georgian bay in the whole region boats listed everywhere and wrapped there's so boating many container. that are wrapped there is literally probably 10 percent of people that said screw it i'm not even unwrapping my boat this year really because i'm, I'm not joking my, my father-in-law was one of them too he's like i'm not even unwrapping my boat didn't unwrap his boat he's gonna go on your boat well i mean, I'm on my boat's in water <laughs> but i mean same thing like you know you just think okay well i don't have to re-winterize it if i don't even unwinterize it so i can just stay there and i don't feel like paying these gas prices this year so i'm just not even going to do it so i mean there is demand destruction happening like you know and some of these yachts you know that are like 40 50 footers that are sitting yeah. there wrapped still this is june some of those people are thinking no and i mean they're dropping like some of these fill-ups are like five ten grand so i mean there's demand destruction happening and this is obviously small you know but but it's just showing little pockets of demand destruction that starts to occur so I got boats some, uh... listed like everywhere you can buy a boat cheaper than you could pre-covid they have this they had the huge bump in price and they've just collapsed so, I mean, this is, you know, one thing to think about is demand destruction hits everything if it starts to come in. And it's going to hit the oil and gas companies, too. I want to kind of show here a graphical representation of what we've been seeing in energy. This is from Bespoke Invest. Uh, good follow if you guys want to follow on sure. Twitter. I like to follow, you know, some statistics like we get, you know, some time to time from LPL. Uh, this one's an interesting one. It's the S&P energy sector and the rolling over of two weeks. So 10 trading day percentage change here at 23 at, at a negative 23.7 percent this is the third worst two-week stretch here drop for the s p 500 energy sector over the last 40 plus years so uh the only thing you could come in and compare this to is march 2020 and october of 08 um i know probably you guys know more about that october of 08 i i remember <laughs> at least 2020 um, but definitely uh, seeing that quick turnaround there in two weeks, down 23.7%. When crowded trades become uncrowded in a hurry, this is what occurs. That was such a crowded trade. Every talking head on CNBC talking about, you know, the oil stocks. You got to be long the oil stocks. They're still talking. Got to be long the oil stocks. They think this is just a healthy pullback. The top is in. The top in the oil stocks is in. You've got to be selling rallies into this stuff now. One person who's had it correct, Steve Grasso. And we'll give you some shout out there, Steve. You've absolutely had this correct. Um, he was, you know, talking similar to what I was talking a month ago, that eventually the demand destruction's coming. And I mean, My we're we're going into a recession. It's not a matter of if. Forget about that. It's It's when it occurs. It's going to happen. And I mean, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing demand destruction. You're seeing wealth destruction ahead of the demand destruction. So are they oversold now? They are. Are they due for a bounce? I think so. I think you could get, yeah. but if you start thinking like, you know, even look at the XOP from 170 down to 120, get back up there, Joel, like 135, 140. You don't think you got happy sellers all of a sudden? You got all kinds of overhead supply now, all kinds of willing sellers saying, oh, I can't believe I just gave back three months. I was getting killed in my tech stocks. Now I'm getting killed in my oil stocks. <laughs> this is what they're saying. This is what they're saying. Well, you know why? That was predictable. That was common. Because in bear markets, they eventually come for everything. And that's what they're doing. now. So, so I mean, in rallies, you got to be sellers of these stocks here now. So, um, you know, obviously, portfolio allocation, know your time horizon, know all of that. You know, are we going higher over the course of the next decade in oil stocks? I'd be more comfortable in tech stocks and oil stocks. But, you know, in all likelihood, you know, stocks do eventually come back. But this is a pretty good hit. And stocks just aren't, they aren't going to be bottom this time. You know, one thing that I, I've been looking at and uh, I can kind of show graphi graphical representation of what you were talking about with Burke B and kind of uh, ARKK here. I'll throw that up really quickly as I make these comments. Now, one thing you've traded, you, you traded the dot com era and the tech bubble. Um, one thing that we saw in the tech bubble was, of course, the separation there from growth and value, value leading for a certain amount of time then growth kind of trailing off. And then eventually they even hit value when value started coming down and growth also came down. So that's going to be my concern now is if we start seeing the value trade come off and we see growth getting hit. So that's my question now, Dennis. And, and I think we'll we've already seen it. I think we're already seeing. That's why I've started nibbling back in the stocks. I mean, I think we've already seen the value trade come off. It can come off more. It might come off a little bit more. 
But growth is sh- showing a lot of strength right now. Mm-hmm. Air KK is healthy. I'd be a buyer of these growth stocks on pullback. Some of them just have gotten down to ridiculous valuations. I mean, this is why Zendesk, all of a sudden, you know, private equity is looking and saying, it's a $120 stock. They don't want to sell to us 140 Well, your stock's 57 bucks right now. Do you want to sell to us at 110 Do you see Zoom? So, have you seen Zoom lately? It's holding up awesome. Yeah. Again, and you know what? You know what? I, I, they're changing, and I, I'm surprised this hasn't been mentioned. Um, there's been a note, because I use Zoom for uh, some of my stuff, and there's a little a little thing up in the, in the top, and it says, as of July 15th, Free Zoom users are going to be limited to forty-minute meetings. So uh, they they're cutting the meeting. They're cutting the meeting down. Well, yeah, because they want you to pay, baby. Hey, they want you to pay. I mean, hey. I already pay. Yeah, well, I already uh, pay. Right. I don't even know what package I have. I just get the bill, and it's easy to work. And Mitch is trying to get me to go to Streamline, but yeah, I, get off yeah. of Zoom, man. Get off. Uh, of then Zoom, I gotta though. learn something new. I'm too old to learn something. I, new. I'll tell you one you thing. The problem, uh, a big problem with Zoom, is also their recording quality. And so I think they need to address that. That's one thing that Zoom has uh, pretty poor in. Um, when you take a look at their recording quality, and I mean a lot of shows run out of zoom right now so um i think they need to up their game but i think that you're gonna see some features change but of course keep your eyes growth coming back i always just peek at arkk and see those holdings how they're performing on the day because that usually okay. gives you a quick Didn't sign make new lows <laughs> are you saying, lows i mean that's held. it, it, it made healthy lows double in bottom in place yeah our arkks looked as good as it has in six months, like from a from a healthy double bottom from a technical standpoint. From a technical standpoint, now again, you just ran ten percent in two days. I don't like chasing, but you know, it seems like they always give you another chance. We'll have some, you know. The, 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 I'll tell you what the next crisis. This is like the most predictable market ever. Twenty twenty two. You know what the next crisis is? We got European financial that? crisis coming here. Look at Deutsche Oof. Bank, Joel. Oh no, the Deutsche no, Bank indicator. This is the next thing coming. Which you know, uh, with the Ukraine situation, with okay, everything I going know. on. This yeah, is yeah. coming, man. This is your next one. You're going to start hearing about contagion. You're going to start hearing about European financial crisis. I mean, look at these European bank stocks. They are all making new lows. And don't kid yourself. There's a reason that Citigroup does not bounce. And again, we could go to the bank stress test, which we're fine. Um, and maybe they're going to do some, you know, capital reallocation, you know, on Monday night. You know, maybe they're going to do a little more buybacks, a little more dividends. But the banks are not showing any life whatsoever. Yeah, and if you've been good, in this value bank trade, you have been crushed by the value trap. Hey, at so, least just to mention here, the bank stress, uh, they passed the stress test at least. They passed. Everyone passed. They probably do a little bit more reallocation there. But one thing to consider is that, you know, you can say higher interest rates should help the bank. What the hell is going on? The bank stocks are showing you that recession is imminent. The bank stocks do not do well because think about bad loans coming in during a recession. Think about, you know, somebody, you know, remember Jingle Mail, Jingle Mail, housing prices, rates are going up here. It's like, okay, I can make my payments. I'll max my credit cards out. I'll stop. I'll sell the toys. I'll do that. After a certain point in time, it's like, okay, I'm walking away from my house. I mean, that's not off the table. That's not off the table. And the banks are telling you there is an issue. So again, the Fed has to, time this really well they need to jack the rates we got someone in the green room here we got bring someone it back in the, down we got someone in the green room here of course we do you know who exactly hey first thing i want to do is uh smash the like guys if you guys are first excited of our guests who took a peek into the description who saw who's coming on definitely let me know in the chat let's go ahead let's get right into it let's bring on tim seymour here cnbc's fast money and cio of seymour asset management Let's bring him on. Welcome, Tim. Welcome to the morning. show. Morning, fellas. Great to be here, as always. I feel like it's been too long. I, I, what, what took so long for the follow-up invite? Is it because the last time we did this, I was in the backseat of the New York City taxi cab? Yes. We liked that, though. It was cash cab. We were doing cash <laughs> hey. cab. It was awesome. I, need, I needed, to, I needed to, to show up and you know sit down in my chair and actually be in front of some screens so I could have an intelligent conversation for once. So uh, anyway, it's great to be here. And there's... Uh, no lack of things going on out there. So uh, uh, it was want- January, Tim. Uh-huh. It was January, and you were taking your kid to school. Yeah, and yep. uh, you had taken them off to school. So wow, how th- you know 
we will get you on not not wait so long next time but boy oh boy have things changed in the last six months so why don't you just start out i mean we can beat a dead horse we'll beat it even more inflation recession depression where are you at wow, i don't always say depression <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I thought you, i thought you wanted to know where we've gone since january as it relates to my kids school because i mean it, right it, at least. Out there too but we'll, we'll save that for another show nobody wants to hear about this um so this morning japan learns that they've actually got two and a half percent inflation rate. So who out there, raise your hands if you actually think Japan's inflation on the CPI level is at two and a half percent. I mean, that, that right. So um, as in you know, Japan has been uh, the one place in the world where suddenly there is no inflation and the BOJ is on planet Mars uh, or you know maybe not even in this universe in terms of their approach to to how they've been either, you know, Interest rate targeting, what what they addressed in terms of inflation, obviously the, the 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 currency dynamics there, and I don't want to get too lost in Japan, but 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 it's just you know there's so many different uh, kind of links in this chain, and and where central banks around the world have have followed the Federal Reserve, um, have had no choice, and 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 it's it's at some point you know we haven't even really begun to unwind a lot of these excesses, so. Um, I, I think, you know, in the markets context, um, uh, unfortunately, I think there's still some more pain to go. Um, I heard earlier part of the conversation also just as it related to uh, the European interest rate dynamics, but European banks, um, I, I would just argue that it, it was it was the, the summer of 2011 uh, when when Mario Draghi really you know, learned how to flex some muscle, but had to. And the European sovereign crisis, the southern European sovereign crisis, was really, I think, one of the the, the major catalysts to more, uh, you know, accommodation from global central banks being thrown on. Obviously, the ECB, but I am very worried about Southern Europe. I'm very worried about uh, their ability to really keep yields down there. And and uh, you know, I think there's different there's different pieces here. But um, in, you know, on the short term, uh, look, inflation as we've seen over the last call it three weeks or so, even a couple of the last data points on, on the monthly series is, um, as it relates to commodity prices, ag prices um, ha have, have given some relief. Metals prices seem to be coming down and pricing in reflect, uh, recession. So there, 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 there is some type of relief here. And, and ultimately, the, you know, the question that I think also has already been asked uh, on this show this morning is is you know what's the trade-off as it relates to central bank policy and recession what have we priced in and 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 if you're talking about the different phases of any real economic cycle um, especially one that's uh, got the, the challenges around growth and possibly you know the credit implications that come with it is you know when when do we get to the credit phase and and we haven't gotten to the credit phase so it's not all doom and gloom this morning i mean i i, I do think that there's some elements of of the way markets have worked so far um, that are actually been very efficient. And, and we've priced in a lot of recession. I, I think we've priced in uh, an enormous amount of recession, especially in banks, uh, but also in certain parts of, of the cyclical economy. Um, the question really is, is what should we be preparing for on the next two legs, which uh, again, in any cycle, um, the, EPS re the EPS downgrades are coming but it's really about pricing and credit. Uh, and then if you have a credit crisis, you have a liquidity crisis. And, and we haven't even begun to, to digest that, but that's for, you know, that's for our show in the late fall, I guess. I mean, Tim, and, and you've hit on a lot of different subjects here. We luck, you know, at the European banks, you can luck in it. But I mean, look at our banks. I mean, not even luck, like Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and they passed the stress test yesterday, and that's good news. And maybe there's going to be some capital allocation plans here coming Monday. But I mean, you look and they're like, I think you hit the nail on the head is I think you, a lot of these stocks maybe have priced in that we are going into some type of a recession here. I mean, JP Morgan, Citigroup, they just keep making new lows every single day. I mean, even Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, new 52 week low again yesterday. Some of the growth stocks have started to pop back. But at what point in time are stocks cheap enough that we can say, you know, we've priced in a lot of bad news and maybe we should start nibbling in now? Well, um, and by the way, Berkshire last time I checked is is not even really a financial, right? I mean, it's it's an Apple proxy. It's it's a couple. That's of, true it's, too. Forty five percent Apple. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's you know, you have to be careful about how you assess that. But um, and I'm not, I'm not up in Warren's grill here. I think he's actually done. I, I, I I've been extremely impressed by the positioning that have gone on there and and being ahead of the curve on energy, ahead of the curve even on on uh, uh, some of the other you call it yeah commodity based investments um, not being overextended and we shouldn't be surprised by him not being overextended into um, high multiple stuff but anyway um, yeah I, I think a, a lot has been priced in it's it's it is difficult to own banks if if uh, you're in an environment where uh, we are facing recession and where Main Street hasn't really even begun to uh, to feel the pain of this and, and we talk all the time about Wall Street versus Main Street. I mean, you know, so far, uh, everything we've talked about in terms of really the pain in in uh, uh, the macro drop backdrop and how it's played out, um, it's played out on Wall Street. It hasn't really played out on Main Street, right? Job jobs are people. We're essentially at full employment. Um, people have money in the bank. They have money uh, to maybe even uh, tolerate higher inflation. Um, and I think those are reasons why we've we've kind of fared as well as we have on Main Street. But I, I you know, that's it, it's just not going to play out that way if we continue to move at the pace we're moving on the economy. And, and, and so, again, you know, the macro conversation is it's a fascinating time to be a macro investor here. And it just seems interesting that uh, we have these cycles every five to ten years where. Uh, the rock stars in the markets are the macro guys, and 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 as a guy who invested in emerging markets and has you know most of his career, um, it's very heavy macro uh, oriented, and and I just say that you know it's a fascinating time because there's stuff that we just haven't ever seen before. At least the confluence of, of uh, a dollar at twenty year highs. Uh, obviously, everybody's very focused on breaking this uh, on, on the the up word break of the 40 year downtrend in in interest rates and um you know throw in and inflation we haven't seen in 40 years throw in a central bank that hasn't been in this position in 40 years um throw in uh, geopolitics that always seem different and unique but in this case they really are so um it's hard to really know where this is going and that's why i think investors uh let's you know, take this back to, to markets that that's why sentiment is is as low as it is and and the, the sentiment readings are shockingly low right so if you look at those aaii bull bear readings or your your you know there's there's many different ones that people use they they're all useful and they're all you know tell you nothing um but it, it, it in terms of the context of of where sentiment is um, I think the print at the end of uh, I think they do it as the week ending June 22 um, was the fourth lowest of all time. Um, it was uh, just off the lows of April 22 or April 23 or whatever that reading was. Uh, and, and, and then you go all the way back to March of 09. So, um, I mean, these are, you know, these are this is serious context for saying just, you know, how how cautious, how negative uh, is sentiment in in the market. Uh, both and then there's you know questioning whether it's you know, who are you measuring are you measuring institutional or are you measuring retail um, I don't think I, I know retail is is really negative here and and obviously looking at high multiple stocks and crypto and and EV and things that you know quote unquote retail has been a heavy participant in and that tells you all you need to know about the sentiment there but but really if you look at fund flows um, in terms of retail fund flows and passive fund flows, we've seen no let up in the fund flows yet. And that that's another thing to concern me. I think really the folks that have been hunkered down in the sentiment has been has been mostly uh, awful and cautious in the institutional world. So just, you know, some 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 things to think about there, too, which are that I don't think we've seen retail capitulation at all. Um, I think we've seen an institutional community uh, that took down their gross, that took down their nets. Um, that that you know certainly have had uh, plenty of places where there have been some high profile blowups and in, uh, in the hedge fund space, and we're going to hear about more. But I just don't even think this has played out. So sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, that's okay. You're good. That's what Tim. we do for an hour every day. 
<laughs> I appreciate it. We're, we're getting your insight true. And I feel like sometimes when you, you know, you go on a little ramble, that's when you really get out those good opinions. So let's go diving into a little bit of another subject here, the emerging markets. Um, one of the areas that I've been focusing more on is, of course, what's happening right now in China. Um, yep. We're starting to see a little bit of it looks to me like some bottoming in these tech stocks. How do you see China now? It, it, it's fascinating, uh, again, because uh, typically my history, emerging markets bottom first, right? Um, they, they, they're they the ones that also sell off first. Um, and if you if you look at a chart of the, uh, or the, the VWO or pick your pick your emerging market proxy, um, you know, you can see that, that the sell off here that was a combination of things uh, is something that we, we probably saw. Uh, well, let's put it this way. In, in March of last year, if you'd asked me what was going on in emerging markets, um, I would have said, oh, my gosh, you know, here we go. It's it's 2003, four, five all over again. It's it's off to the moon. And we were off to the moon and we we kind of briefly broke out to all time highs uh, in the context of, of uh, interest rates were, were moving higher and they were seemingly moving higher for the right reason. Um, and and and, you know, ultimately, since that time, you saw emerging markets. Uh, I'm just looking at my charts here. Right. So so EM EM trades off about 42 percent on the e, EM um, from that high. But but if you look at it relative to the S&P, uh, EEM really underperformed the S&P all the way until probably, you know, I'm going to say April. Um, and in fact, if you've been following emerging markets for the last 10 years or 20 years, uh, really since uh, the the 2011 period, again, this, call it the, the European uh, sovereign crisis was part of this. But but you you've seen emerging markets continue to make relative new lows against the S and P and 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 so um, that's something that despite this this seemingly it was it was really kind of a head fake breakout uh, in in uh, the spring and, and early summer of last year emerging has has been taking it on the chin and there's a couple of reasons for it we all know the move the dollars had um, we all know the move that that uh, I think we've seen in you know the dynamics around the Big brother in China, uh, the the attack on the Chinese tech company. So we'll get to that. But just as an asset class, emerging markets really underperformed first. Um, are they bottoming here? Maybe. Um, and and I'll just say that if you look at at since that that April low, uh, EMs outperformed the S and P by I don't know ten or eleven percent in in the last couple months. Um, is that sustainable? I don't know. But um, if you look at some of the drivers of that, there's no question that there seems to be less pressure on on the national champion tech companies and obviously we're talking about alibaba we're talking about tencent um to a lesser extent we'd be talking about you know baidu and and some of the other uh, uh metuan and, and actually some you know some of the insurance companies and the online players though that that at least are, are part of their new economy um i'm never going to say i i have an edge on understanding what the chinese government's going to do in terms of uh, how they feel they need to reel in their companies to maintain social control but um it does feel as if and we've seen this at different times in the last 10 or 15 years uh china who 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 very much wants to sit at the the head table of global capital markets and and legitimacy and and you know and it's this weird irony that that china shoots itself in the foot all the time because china's china um and and i say that not socially i say that in terms of of the their economy and their approach and their approach to uh a controlled economy and and it's just what it is so um in a world of of uh technology companies that that clearly really almost know no bounds um they've been reeling in their tech companies that have certainly flown ahead of the government and and so is that over um who i think knows? the worst of it for a little while who knows you know? tim i just want to hop in uh i gotta get your 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 take on uh one more thing and um you know dennis is you know he, he takes money in and out um allocates more to the market goes to a higher cash position and stuff i've been i'm pretty much steady like i you know I try not to panic at bottoms and i try not to add at tops uh one thing with uh you know with considerable cash on the sideline the geopolitical situation i mean is 
you know, what's going on with Russia. Like we talk about recession. We talk about all these things that are going on. But we have a major, major geopolitical situation on that we really can't control. Now, I mean, how do you incorporate that with all these other things going on? You know, how do you incorporate something like that into your investment strategies? I think geopolitics are are always a challenge and and always on some level uh, are are not really the the um the ingredient that is the most critical to your investment allocation and 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 russia ukraine um is horrific and uh like I'm, i i lived in russia for half i'm i'm i've spent a lot of time in that part of the world um it's upsetting it's it's uh it's scary and it's had an impact on the world uh, in, in a major way uh, in an economic sense, but um, I, I, I think the what we're dealing here really is is all about you know central bank dynamics and and you know where okay. uh, as as uh, you know gone gone haywire and and uh, we've created we've created a monster that I think uh, Jerome Powell has to deal with. Um, if you're an investor, uh, I, I think this is a really interesting time to actually be allocating to the market. Uh, last night on Fast Money, we took some focus on how you know, Facebook, uh, I guess we should call them meta. I get I get added on, on Twitter all the time. I still call them Facebook. I'm um, sorry. And I still call one. Google Google. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but <laughs> but look, we talked about how, how meta uh, Netflix and PayPal are now going into the Russell Value Index. Um, now, all of those companies, for different reasons, um, have, have have issues and have reasons why they're down anywhere from from you know sixty to seventy five, eighty percent from their all time highs. But but they're, they're, these are companies that aren't going anywhere, uh, and these are companies that I actually think look pretty darn interesting here uh, on a price to sales or on a PE basis and. And so I, I just think if you're picking at investments of companies um, that are uh, well positioned, either in terms of their balance sheet or their business model, um, this is a great time to be picking at the market. This is a great time. To be, um, and, 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 I, and I think you have, to, you have to do it with a level of perspective and you have to do it with the confidence of knowing a little bit about what you're investing in. The only way you can invest through difficult times is to keep your head on straight. And to understand that actually, no, you know, Walmart uh, traded down 25% on an announcement on their inventory. And yeah, I understand that their consumer may be under more pressure um, than other segments and demographics. But, but you know, I love Walmart here. I, I got to tell you, I, I think Walmart's a great company. It's well positioned in e-commerce. And I, I, I think you should be thinking that way as an investor. Without a doubt, We're Tim, I actually... We're up against the clock here. Yeah, go ahead, Mitch. No, definitely. I, I actually uh, mentioned Walmart yesterday. I was looking at it, too. A little bit of sleepiness uh, looks interesting. So I appreciate you even dropping one extra there for us, uh, bringing in Walmart. Thank you, Tim, for coming on. Like always, we'll definitely have you back on. Uh, CNBC's Fast Money, CIO of Seymour Asset Management. I know a lot of the chat's always keeping up with you. So thank you for coming on here and taking the time today, Tim. Uh, guys, I love it. Love this conversation every morning. Sorry that I, uh, I'm drinking my coffee, and obviously, you know, the best uh, the best moment of the day is that first cup of coffee, uh, and it's not the coffee right now. It's hanging. Cheers with you. to that. There there we go. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Sorry Thank about the too. Rangers too. They were so close, man. I was going to mention the Rangers. Uh, so close. My uh, Oilers, same. Thank you. My Oilers didn't come quite as close. I but. The sincerity in which it was delivered. I mean, it was a great season. It was a frustrating, uh, uh, you know, end of the year, but it. Opened Unless you win the cup, and I'm pretty happy with where we went. So thanks, yeah. and uh, let's see if the let's see if if let's see if the lightning can come back and make this a little bit more of a series. It's been a good one though. That's been good. Definitely. All right. Thank you, Tim. Let's go ahead. We're going to wrap on up here, guys. We're already getting there towards 9 a.m. Here we had a little bit too much fun there with Tim, but like always, we. We, we try to we, get to people that have some great uh, opinions here. So I think Tim <laughs> brought a lot there. Um, you might want to rewind that, even listen to it again. Uh, yeah, minutes. I just, I got to hop. I just, yeah. uh, and I wanted to mention this at the top of the show and I didn't get a chance. Uh, 34 and a quarter is the pre-market high, right? 33 and a quarter was our Fed day high. I like to put little names on my you levels. Can you put the chart okay? up real quick? Uh, okay. 
Um, How'd you explain it? That oh, way oh, I got the, what you're um, this was our this was our Fed Day high, right? This is when uh, you know, Mr. Powell, where was it? Um at ES, it was right here. And that is where we got up to uh, oh actually this is our Fed day high. We went a little bit higher and then we fell apart. So let's just keep an eye on this whole the pre-market high up to the recent high of the rebound at 38.43. And uh that's a big level to clear the day. I'm gonna hop up. Uh, Mitch, I'll catch up with you later on. Uh triple D, go get them. Good luck on yeah. that Russell rebalance. Yeah, expect the volatility to close. One thing, Zen desk deal is done. Price is 77.50. So a take under from where it was trading in the pre-market. This thing ticked up to $94 right. dollars Definitely in the pre-market. And obviously it wasn't the premium. I think what was spooking the risk guard, why they were pricing it so much, was that that they said that they had that potential $17 billion takeout uh, on the table earlier. This comes off the board at just over $10 billion. So they took a hell of a lot less than they were going to get six months ago, obviously, you know, disappointing probably to ZEN shareholders, especially the ones that were buying in the pre-market. But if you're wondering why this thing just collapsed, that is why the price, the official deal hit, I believe at 852 uh, when we were talking with Tim price from press release from the company, $77 and 50 cents is the takeout price. Obviously risk arbs knock off the time value of money into there, which is why we're trading the 75 handle. So Take under uh, uh, risk arbitrage traders a little bit too excited when they're paying up to ninety four dollars this morning. There, hey, that's as simple as that can happen. And you know, one of the things as a, a rumor going from a rumor to the news, right? Uh, the rumor was definitely bought up, and looks yeah. like the news was actually sold. There, uh, classic story. There, uh, we see this happen often. So definitely, uh, Zen is going to be a little bit more volatile than usual, but we'll see what happens there. Right now, it's around 75. Volatility we'll is going to get sucked out, actually, Mitch. Now it'll get sucked out because yeah, now, now you got a price of 77.50. Exactly the risk arbs will come in. The volatility is going to get sucked right out of this thing because this is an official deal. This is not a rumor now. This mm -hmm. is actually a press release from the company. So you'll see the volatility get sucked out of this thing now. It'll lock itself in for the time value of money, probably somewhere a couple bucks down from the deal price. But time value of money isn't something to discount now. I'm actually surprised that they're still paying 76 and a quarter for this. It's probably people who are short still bringing it in. I would think you know maybe you're going to even be lower than that with the time value of money, although I don't know how long it's going to take to do a deal like this. But I would think more 75-ish than 76 and a quarter because if the upside 70, then I got a buck and a quarter upside. I don't want to sit around and wait for my money. So I'm surprised this thing's trading 76 and a quarter. I would think it'd be in the 75 handle. Definitely something to keep on watch. And another thing to keep on watch, of course, is the relationships. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, what would you say, Dennis, now that you've got an actual price, how the other... I think you're going to be disappointed. Ones. I think uh, shareholders who are really hoping for a huge premium and a big payday are probably somewhat disappointed because the stock mm -hmm. was trading up to 94, 90, 88, all pre-market after hours last night. And now you get the deal at 77.50. It's so, you know, it's kind of like, ugh. So obviously, you know, people were thinking maybe there is going to be a 12, 13, you know, billion dollar offer coming here and it ends up just over 10. So I think shareholders somewhat disappointed here. There you guys see it. Zendesk uh, flipping around there. Um, it was trading up at 1.50% after hours and now uh, right back down there. So we'll see what happens. Like always, Dennis, thank you for coming on. Thank you for a great week. Like always, we want to thank you for everything that you do for us and kind of keeping us in the informational edge, really what all traders kind of need. So thank you, Dennis. And we'll, we'll see you next week, my friend. Get better. Get better. I think the chat would tell you too. All right, definitely. Let's go ahead. We're going to wrap on up. We'll get you guys over to all access just in about 10 minutes here. So don't go anywhere. If you guys want to stick around and maybe do some ticker time or some stocks that you guys want to check on out, throw it up in the chat. I'm here for you guys. I got my charts on up. I can cover some things and I could also cover how I'm seeing the overall market. Um, I know that a lot of people are looking to probably see a growth type of day today um, and, a, and an up type of day. But I think we're getting really close towards back towards the turnaround here for the dead cat bounce. Uh, reason why, at least in my eyes, um, is that I'm starting to see what I'm starting to see uh, kind of this RSI really start pushing here. Um, we can get up there towards the 85 on the hourly. I've been looking at the daily. You can see how we bounced off that 23 a couple of times. I'm looking to see how high we can get up here. Do we fill into the gap? 
because that could come all the way up there towards 389. Another thing that happens is I've been trying to point to what has been the pattern, right? And so the patterns kind of have been showing me that we're seeing these decline, bounce, decline, bounce, then takedown, right? Then we got this huge takedown where we were kind of in the similar pattern to here, but we actually came up towards the other resistance. So the next level resistance here, and this was a period between, and I'll kind of give you guys the period here. Uh, this is between May 9th and may 25th here then what did we do we bounced up there towards the next resistance we were holding that gain it was a nice little push i mean if you measure it from the bottom on up there that's about 7.62 percent so these are the kind of rallies that we see in bear markets where we get that nice rally on up but what happens after the next resistance boom smack down again so the question is do we get to that same kind of view again and where do we find resistance? Is it resistance here around the 381s? And, and you can you maybe use this high here that you got on uh, June 15th, where you have a 383.90. Do we run into resistance there and knock right back down? Or do we fill up to the next resistance and continue back towards this longer trend line here? So that could be a move back up to 410 even and then getting knocked down so it doesn't leave that out of question at least in my eyes that this could still be a dead cat rally we'll see what happens like always nobody knows but i'm just giving you guys the patterns and the analysis how i would take a look at it all right we'll go ahead and take a look here what else is being thrown in the chat there's some love there's some love uh, i did see some love for triple d get better they love you man and that's what it, that's what we do here um, let's take a look at some other stocks. If you guys got specific tickers to take a look at, we can do that. Uh, NVIDIA's expectation for today. I can take a look there. NVIDIA, let's see how that's trading right now. I think you have a good level to go off of. I would draw this line up here a little bit closer towards these body close now. At least you have like kind of the lows right now and, and kind of the close of this here around the 161.80 level. And the 161.75 level, I would look for it to hold on any pullbacks, looking for a nice move up if that's the way I'm looking right now. If I'm thinking that we can still get that kind of dead cat rally back on up. One of the things that you can use too is I love using the hourly charts for moves like this. And you can see here a little bit of some sideways action. We're looking to see it get back above that 167. If it can get back above that 167, I think you can come back and try to test this high here up there towards the 170 outlook. So I'm going to look for a push, first push around 167, a pullback there. Um, what would get me a little bit bearish is that if we start getting into this zone here, down towards the 160s, if we take out 160s, it could easily just be right back down to 155. Like always, it's never uh, a perfect way, uh, but you got to go ahead and kind of take a look there. Uh, Pre-market prep, uh, what time frame is this? 15 minutes. So a lot of times I'm going to be looking at an hourly and the daily um, on, on the SPY there. I was looking at the daily chart. So um, you could take a look at the daily. You can see how you get those bounces and get that flush right back down. Also, I like to use the hourly and maybe the four-hour chart to kind of show that. Another thing to kind of show yesterday is we were in sideways range for so long here, finally breaking above that sideways range. Where was that range that it was rejecting a lot was 377.85. We weren't getting closes above that yesterday. I'm going to look to see if we break that on the downside here at the open, because if that happens, we could see some more chop. But if we get a quick move in a direction, that's what I'm looking for as, as a day trader out there. We're looking for those actual trend kind of moves so that we can get these patterns to give us continuation. If you noticed a lot of fake outs and break uh, breakdowns yesterday where the patterns were just not holding. A lot of this has to do with times when we're on that sideways action. When we see that sideways action, we're going to see a lot more of those fake outs in between. All right, let's go ahead. Let's take a look at some of those tickers that you guys wanted to take a look at. I, the first one was, um, let me, before I get away from it, NVIDIA, let's go to Walmart now. Let's take a look here. Walmart is interesting to me because now we're really starting to get that sideways action. A lot of the times when I'm looking for a stock that has really declined really fast, I need to see at least a month of sideways action here to tell me that, okay, at least now I really have some levels to go off. This has been about 24 bars or 1.2 months going sideways where you probably got an increase around, let's say, 3%. 
It's not much right now, but it could get moving above the 125s, moving into this range up here around the 128s. So close towards 128 would definitely get me a little bit more bullish on Walmart. Why am I looking at Walmart? Because I'm looking at discount stores overall. Take a look here at the in this in the uh, at the industry index here that I have um, on discount stores, and you can see how we really declined really fast, but now have been going sideways for a little bit here. Let's take a look at some of these names and how they've been doing. A lot of it I'll use an RSI daily outlook, and so stocks that have been strong are going to be the ones that are higher up here. So you see 79 rating here on Ollie. Look how this has been moving lately. This is really coming back and starting to look strong. Discount stores, guys. What would we expect? Dollar General also doing well here. So I'm going to be keep watching these names to see if we catch that bounce. BJ's looking like it wants to come back on up. For that mention, take a look at Costco. Uh, this one could get coming back on through the 500. So I think that you get definitely keep these on your radar. Stocks like Dollar Tree maybe making another ramp on up. And we all know when we start getting to discount stores, a lot of the times what has, happens is people start going more towards Walmart than let's say a Target. Um, so that might be why you're seeing Target lag a little bit. But if Walmart could really lead us up and we can get some of these other stocks to continue making moves, we could see the whole overall industry make that lift. All right, let me keep going here. Uh, FDP, three white shoulders, any thought? Uh, let's take a look there. FDP. All right, Fresh de Monte, uh, farm products is, is some area that I think you definitely keep this on your radar. I would look, and when I look at the uh, kind of farm product stocks, um, they don't move that often, at least for like a long period of time. So you see here from 14 to about 2017, you had a big drive. That was about 120 something percent. But if you see here, what have you been in? Kind of been stuck in this pattern here. And so until we get above that, I really wouldn't be going too far into this. But if we can get into this zone here, that's where I really think you start reversing this bearish pattern and you can really start seeing this come back into a trend. I wouldn't be overreacting. I would look for a little push on up there. But if you take a look here at the 15 minute, uh, definitely looking like it's getting some more favor maybe look for a pullback uh, closer towards the 25 or the 25 40 25 50 area we'll see what happens there it's definitely up right now could get a little bit of a pullback fdp but like always determine your own level guys i'm just here to try to help you out uh matthew's saying he thinks it's a dead cat bounce we'll see what happens there um let's keep going here let me make sure i'm good here on my end yeah i'm still good here on all access, we'll be getting to all access in just a few minutes here, uh, getting you over there at 915, about three minutes left. And I'll definitely be trading in the chat if you guys want to kind of hang out and kind of talk about some stocks here. All right, Baba. Baba is one that I've been calling towards the bullish side since that DD push. And you guys see, I ha I've had that circle drawn here for a while now. I really am seeing this getting stronger and stronger. And I feel like this is uh, missing out an opportunity. I talked about it with Tim Seymour about emerging markets. The reason I brought up emerging markets is that I am I am also thinking that too many people are focused only in the U.S. market, and they're not realizing that a lot of times, like he said it, he said it perfectly well. He said a lot of times you see bottoming in emerging markets first. And then you see us come back up. So that's what I'm looking for in China. I'm going to keep these on my radar. Stocks like Baba, stocks like JD. I think JD has a nice setup today. If you take a look at the daily, we've had multiple runs to 65s and failed there. So I'm going to go ahead and just put a, a, a resistance right there. That's where I want to go ahead and see the stock get on up there too today. You can see it sideways here just kind of sleepy here in the pre-market. I'm actually going to look for a big rip on up through 63 uh, 50s to say maybe take a trade on JD to the upside. Another one you can keep on watch is PDD. Um, I would keep this one on watch also. You can see here this one at least showing a little bit more strength as it gets up there to that ascending triangle. And we'll look to see if it holds any pullbacks closer towards uh, 64 that one, I think it could pull back a little bit because it's a little bit extended, but we'll see what happens here at the gates. Like always, just keep it on watch. All right, let's keep going. Uh, what other ones being mentioned? Semiconductor, foundry growth, trend outlook, a Ambia. 
Ambria. I haven't looked at Ambria in a long time. Um, so it's not a bad one to keep on watch. Uh, you guys, uh, eh, it hasn't been moving well lately, um, but it is coming back down towards kind of levels where it makes more sense. I would look for it to come back into this price zone. So that's a move back down into uh, the 40s and maybe even uh, low 50s. So right now, I still think it's a little bit high price and showing me weakness. Nothing that I want to change into right now, uh, but it could get a little lift going up there towards 75. I just don't see too much relative strength right now. All right, uh, CCL, finally they got their earnings out. Yeah, I wanted to cover some earnings. Um, we didn't even get a chance to cover FedEx today. I'm going to go ahead and cover it right now. Oh, it's 9.15. Let me take a quick peek at that CCL earnings there for you. Um, looks like it. Oh, looks like it's getting hit right now, guys. Take a look here at CCL. It's taking a little bit of a downturn there, uh, down there from 9.85s to 9.60s. It just doesn't look that great in the cruise lines right now. And I thought these would come back. I thought that we would get a ramping in travel. But really what has happened is I think the demand destruction in gasoline prices for the consumer's pocket, for the savings, is really showing up here. And it just shows me that I should be more and more concerned about what is going on in the consumer and the credit card issue that probably we're starting to see. The savings accounts are going to zero. And what are you seeing? More credit, 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 credit. And a lot of America is living paycheck to paycheck, which is a sad sign, um, especially after a good kind of economic boom in the last 10 years. But um, keep this on your radar. We'll see what happens on out there. I'm going to bring you guys over to All Access now so that you guys can get the stories of some stocks out there. That's what it's all about when we go to All Access. It's about the stories. And if you guys want to continue trading like we normally do on live trading, you guys can go over to the chat. I'll be there. I'll see you guys like always. And go catch Zunaid. My man's running All Access. So if you guys want to go see him, hit the like button. I'll take you guys right over.